This video is part two of chapter nine and we'll be completing our discussion of cellular respiration and then also discussing fermentation. So in the last video we completed glycolysis in which glucose was broken down and two of the primary or one of the primary products was pyruvate. There are two molecules of pyruvate that are produced by glycolysis and those are going to enter what's called the citric acid cycle and the, the processing of pyruvate which includes the citric acid cycle occurs inside the mitochondria in the matrix. So prior to entering the actual citric acid cycle pyruvate is oxidized a little bit and processed somewhat. So one of the carbons on pyruvate which is a three carbon molecule is oxidized into what is called acetyl-CoA. A coenzyme, coenzyme A comes in and is involved in this process and grabs or grabs the remaining two um, carbons from pyruvate and then those go into the citric acid cycle. So if we look at this process, here's the cytosol or the cytoplasm. This is pyruvate which came from glycolysis. Pyruvate enters the mitochondrion and the initial step and in the initial step one of the carbons is oxidized to carbon dioxide the remaining carbons are picked up by coenzyme A in the process since carbon, one carbon was oxidized NAD is reduced into NADH so NADH is produced immediately and then acetyl-CoA is produced when coenzyme A picks up these remaining two carbons from pyruvate it's these remaining two carbons that are going to enter into the citric acid cycle and in this process the complete breakdown of pyruvate occurs and those carbons are oxidized into carbon dioxide. All of the carbon dioxide you exhale comes from the citric acid cycle. The overall output of the citric acid cycle per pyruvate is 1 ATP, 3 NADH, and 1 FADH2. Now FADH2 is another electron carrier similar to NADH, so it's a little bit different structure, but it carries out essentially the same purpose and function. So if we look at this process, here's what happens. Initially, we get the f oxidation of the first carbon from pyruvate, and we already discussed that process a second ago. Then acetyl-CoA is shuttled to the citric acid cycle, where those remaining two carbons are dropped off. Coenzyme A goes on about its business, and we'll repeat what it did before. These carbons are then oxidized throughout the cycle, and during that time, carbon dioxide is produced, NADH is produced, ATP is produced, and FADH is produced. Now notice, there's only one ATP per pyruvate molecule that's produced, so that's not really a whole lot of energy. What's most important as, a, as an output from the citric acid cycle is the NADH and the FADH2, because those are going to go into the next pathway. That pathway is what we call oxidative phosphorylation. It's also known as the electron transport chain, and we'll see why in a minute. So glycolysis and citric acid cycle have occurred, and now NADH and FADH2 from those two processes are going to be um, sent through the oxidative phosphorylation and electron transport, and the electrons will be extracted, meaning the energy will be extracted, in order to produce ATP. Now, the processes of citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation are considered aerobic now because they only occur in the presence of oxygen. So now we are into the aerobic parts of cellular respiration. So let's talk about the pathway of electron transport. The electron transport chain and oxid oxidative phosphorylation occur on the inner membrane or the cristae of the mitochondria. Most of the components of this process are proteins and they're embedded in the in this inner membrane. We'll see that in a second. What they do is they alternatively reduce and oxidize and pass electrons down the chain. And this is important, as we'll see in a minute, to extract energy from those electrons. And then at the very end, oxygen acts as the final electron acceptor to pick up those electrons and form water. And we'll see that in a second. The electrons are transferred from NADH and FADH2 to this chain. And these Proteins along the chain are called cytochromes. There's a bunch of different ones, and you don't need to remember all the different ones. Oddly enough, the electron transport chain doesn't generate ATP directly, but what it does is it facilitates the movement of energy throughout the 
chain in order to extract that energy to produce ATP. So even though it doesn't make the ATP directly, it's still very important in the production of ATP based on the extraction of energy from the electrons that came from NADH and FADH2. So once all these electrons are passed down the chain and this energy is being transferred, a couple of things happen. As the electrons are passed from protein to protein, a little bit of energy is given off to those proteins. And what those proteins do is they pump hydrogen ions from the mitochondrial matrix into the inner membrane space. What that does is it creates a hydrogen ion gradient, which is a form of potential energy. Those hydrogen ions are then going to diffuse back through a protein complex called ATP synthase. That flow of hydrogen ions through ATP synthase gives off a little bit of energy and that energy can be used to build ATP. This process is known as chemiosmosis and we're going to see a diagram of this to make it a little bit more understandable. Here's what ATP synthase looks like. So what happens is the hydrogen ions travel through ATP synthase, they're spat out, and then a little bit of energy is given off to the molecule of ATP synthase. That energy is used to put ADP and phosphate back together to form ATP. And this basically happens at the end of the electron transport chain. So let's take a look at the electron transport chain itself. NADH initially drops off electrons, so it's oxidized, and reduces the first protein in this chain. A little bit of energy is given off to that protein, and that protein pumps hydrogen ions out into the intramembrane space from the matrix. Notice that all along the chain this is occurring. So these arrows represent electrons being bounced down the chain. Okay, They give off energy and allow these proteins to pump hydrogen ions out into this space here. Again, that creates a hydrogen ion gradient, and based on what we know of diffusion, substances want to travel from high concentration to low concentration. So there's a higher concentration of hydrogen ions here. They're going to naturally flow through ATP synthase and facilitate the process of producing ATP. That flow associated with the production of ATP is called chemiosmosis. At the very end of the chain, oxygen, which is available from breathing, comes along and grabs a hold of those electrons and in addition with some hydrogen ions, forms water, which is a harmless byproduct. Now, cells have to have some sort of pathway that allows them to produce ATP in the absence of oxygen, because if a cell runs out of ATP, it's going to die. And your cells don't always have a ready supply of oxygen. So without oxygen, cells use processes called fermentation, and there's two of them in different types of organisms, that allow the cell to produce ATP without oxygen. This is a type of anaerobic respiration, so meaning there's no oxygen involved. There are two kinds of fermentation, and basically what the fermentation does is it, or it the way it's constructed is it consists of glycolysis plus some other reactions which regenerate NAD+, which is then actually reused by glycolysis. So what fermentation really does is through the production of NAD+, it makes glycolysis keep going. So NAD plus is required for glycolysis. That constant supply of NAD plus back to glycolysis keeps glycolysis going. And as we already know, glycolysis is what produces some ATP, even though it's a very small amount. And there are two common types of fermentation, alcohol and lactic acid. In alcohol fermentation, the pyruvate is actually converted to the alcohol ethanol in two steps. The first step releases CO2, and the second step produces ethanol. Yeast and some bacteria carry out this process. The most, uh, very few, if any, animal cells carry out this process. And it can be used in brewing, winemaking, baking, stuff like that. Here's what that process looks like, and lactic acid as well. So pyruvate goes, is produced by glycolysis. It goes through the fermentation pathway. The byproducts are carbon dioxide and ethanol. And then NADH is oxidized in this process into NAD+, which goes back to glycolysis and keeps it going. Lactic acid fermentation is very much the same, except that the main byproduct is lactate or lactic acid. 
So again, the pyruvate is reduced by NADH, which forms NAD+, which goes back into glycolysis. There's no release of CO2. Lactic acid fermentation does occur in some fungi and bacteria, and also it's used to make cheese and yogurt. And in your cells, your muscle cells, use lactic acid fermentation to generate ATP when oxy oxygen is scarce. So like for quick activities like, let's say, jumping or hitting a golf ball or snapping your fingers or something like that.